Good evening everyone. Welcome to Medicos Community. I am Dr. Ramya, your radiology educator in Medicos Community platform. We have already discussed 15 most important clinical MCQs on 16 February. Today we are here to discuss the rest of the questions. Also do not forget to check out the medicoscommunity.com and avail the early bird offer as soon as possible to kickstart your need preparation. So going on to the first question. 15 year old female ultrasound pelvis was done and uterine abnormality with a differential diagnosis of bicornuate uterus or septate uterus was done was given on MRI of pelvis is requested for further assessment. Which of the following findings on MRI is suggestive of a bicornuate uterus? The options are A. Fundal concavity of less than 1 cm Option B. Two uterine cavities Option C. Thin fibrous low intensity septum separating the uterine cavities. Option D. Convex external fundal contour. Option E. Intercornual distance of more than 4 cm. Let us make the session an interactive one students. I want you to answer in the chat box. So before going to the answer, let me tell you briefly about the embryology of the uterine system of the female reproductive system. So from the paramesonephric or mullerian ducts, two tubes are formed and they are fused and that is how the lumen of uterus is formed. And then this is the adult uterus, which, ha which is the, this is the fundus, this is the body and this is the cervix. Okay. And this is the vagina. So if there is any problem with the formation of the tubes or with the fusion or of the regeneration of the septum there will be anomalies which we'll be fur further discussing in detail so someone has answered as c let us see if it is correct or not okay now coming to the anatomy of the fallopian tubes it is important to know the anatomy and embryology so that our basics are perfect and then we don't make any mistakes in the diagnosis. So at 5th or 6th week of gestation, the normal fetus, it, there are undifferentiated gonads. At 5th or 6th week, if there is absence of SRY gene or AMH, then the paramesonephric ducts or the mullerian ducts will grow and the wolfian ducts will disappear. So from the paramesonephric ducts, the uterus and fallopian tubes are formed. So fallopian, this is the fallopian tube to which the gonads, that is the ovaries are hanged in in the coelomic cavity, which is allowing the communication between the peritoneum and the fallopian tubes. The caudal end maintains the communication. This is the caudal end of the fallopian tube and this is the cranial end. Okay. This is the caudal end which is communicating with the uterine cornea. So completely the Wolfian duct will regress and the potential remnants can be in the form of hydatid cyst or the remnants of the mesonephric ducts are the Gardner's duct cyst. So how do we image the fallopian tubes and the uterine cavity if there are any additions in cases for infertility. So actually our question was about uterine anomaly for the best investigation to see a uterine anomaly is MRI pelvis whereas for ruling out infertility because infertility is all about the fallopian tube patency and at the corner inter intermural isthmic ampullary and infundibular regions of the fallopian tube we do a HSG. This is an image of HSG. How we do an HSG? We put a fallopian uh, Foley's catheter into the cervix and contrast is injected and we see the contrast extravasation outside into the peritoneum. That is the free spillage of contrast. If there is free spillage of contrast, it means that there are no blocks in the fallopian tube. Coming to the uterine anomalies, the first MRKH syndrome. There is complete or partial agenesis of the uterus. Type 2 is unicornate, type 3 is didelphis, type 4 is bicornate, type 5 is septate, type 6 is arcuate, type 7 is DES associated anomalies. 
the type 1. See, we have given contrast here and the entire contrast is only going into the right side of the corner. That is, this is a single right uterine horn with right fallopian tube. So, there is right side spillage. Whereas, this is two cornea there, where there is no fusion in between, but there is only one cervical canal. This is bicornate uterus. There is incomplete fusion of the cephaloid extent of the uterovaginal horns with the resorption of the uterovaginal septum. The uh, uterovaginal septum is completely regressed. So, this is a HSG image of a bicornate unicolous uterus. Why I have given HSG images is this is what you have to remember so that your uh, vision is, your vision memory remains intact even when you are reading the subjective or completely uh, word filled MCQ. Okay, So, this is a bicornate uterus. You are able to see there is a distance between these two. This is the intercorneal distance and this is the height. So, exactly this is the height. This is the cleft height and this is the intercorneal distance. Remember these two things, we will be comparing them with others and we will learn in the next coming slides. So, differentiating the uterine bicornate uterus from didelphus. That means there is a two vagina in didelphus. There is only one vagina in bicornate uterus because there is transverse uh, vaginal septum which is regressed. Coming to the septate uterus, there is incomplete resorption of the final fibrous septum between the two uterine horns. It can be partial or it can be complete. So, in this case, there is complete uterine, uh, complete septum and the angle between these two is in contrast with the other one. It is acute whereas there we have seen it is obtuse. So, the bicornate uterus, let me draw it for you. This is the uterine cavity only I am drawing. I am not drawing the external uh, um, external fundus. I don't want to confuse you right now. So, the, the fundus is indent, indented down. This is the cavity. So, definitely the fundus is indented down and the cavities are widely separated for greater than 100 degrees. There is partial fusion of the Mullerian ducts here and the intervening cleft this is the intervening cleft. It is greater than 1 cm and the intercorneal distance, the distance between these two cornea is greater than 5 cm. So, this is bicornate uterus. This is the question we have. So, some places it is given 5, some places it is given 4. Uh, coming to our question. Once again, let us read and I want you to give the correct answer now because I have given you the options uh, explanation already. So, please be active in the chat box. 15 year old female ultrasound pelvis is done, uterine abnormality of a differential diagnosis of bicornate or septate uterus is given. On MRI, we are confirming the diagnosis of a bicornate uterus with the help of what? Of which one? The fundal cavity of less than 1 cm, no, this is probably true for arcuate uterus. There are two uterine cavities, there are two uterine cavities in bicornate as well as didelphus. So, it is not a definitive thing. Thin fibrous low intensity septum separating the uterine cavities. This is the description for septate uterus. Convex external fundal contour. Yes, there is convex external fundal contour, but it is there for bicornate, didelphus. Uh, sorry, the convex uh, external fundal contour is for the normal uterus. Whereas a concave indentation is there for all of the uh, things we have discussed. That is bicornate, didelphus and as well as for arcuate. Intercorneal distance of more than 4 cm is a definitive statement to tell that it is a bicornate uterus. So, Good. You have given the correct answer. Next. So, coming to the septate. There is normal external surface, but there is a septum in between. These are the fallopian tubes and the ovaries. And there is a septum in between. The cavities are so close together, the defect in canalization or resorption of the middle septum between the Mullerian ducts causes the septate uterus. 
This is an uh, image representing the arcuate uterus. There is depression of the uterine fundus. So, coming to the next question. 23-year-old woman, large bilateral low-density renal lesions on CT and large posterior fossa brain tumor. Review of old notes reveals that she has several visits to ophthalmology department, the condition that she is most likely to be suffering from. So, in the images, let's let just give a, I'll give you the uh, options. There is brain involvement, there is kidney involvement and there are eyes are also involved. So, let us see the options first. A. Tuberous sclerosis. B. Von Hippel-Lindau syndrome. C. Germinoma. D. Pilocytic astrocytoma. So, whenever... So, whenever we are uh, giving options and the uh, question is about multiple systems, we should always think about some syndromatic syndrome association in the answers so there is a lag uh, i'm not able to see the answers yet okay fine so, in this image, this is the posterior fossa, that is the cerebellum. We are able to see a cystic lesion with a mural component. This could be a pilocytic astrocytoma if it is a pediatric age group, but this is an adult. So, it is a hemangioblastoma. And we are able to see multiple renal lesions, which are most likely RCC. And also the patient has ophthalmology, uh, she has several visits to the ophthal department. That means there is a chance of retinal angiomatosis. All of these conditions, they are in favor of von hippel lindau syndrome. The best way to remember VHL is through a mnemonic. Hippel, H, hemangioblastoma, I, increased risk of RCC, pheochromocytomas. Pheochromocytoma is an adrenal tumor where the classical sign is light bulb sign which we see as T2 hyper intensity and the clinical features are hypertension so we should be very careful before operating we need to diagnose the patient before operating because there can be uh, anaphylactic reactions and pancreatic lesions Cyst, cystadenoma, cystadenocarcinoma. E is for eye lesion, retinal hemangioblastoma, endolymphatic sac tum tumors. L is liver and renal cysts. Coming to the other options, this is also a syndrome, but the, the brain is involved, the kidney is also involved, but our images don't match to that. So the brain is involved, that is the most characteristic subependymal nodules and white matter heterotrophia, cortical tubers, SEGA, subendothelial gain cell astrocytoma, and in kidney, the cardiac rhabdomyomas and renal angiomyolipomas, and in lungs, lymphangioleomatosis, which is called as LAM, thin walled cysts separated by normal parenchyma surrounding them, and there are always chylus effusions, they are associated with chylus effusion and pneumothorax. So, these are the conditions which come under tuberous sclerosis. The rest of the options, we have already um, removed pilocytic astrocytoma. It is more common in children and it does not have um, and any relation with our uh, question. And germinomas, germinoma are more common at the pineal gland region so first let us try to see the anatomy these are the lateral ventricles this is the third ventricle and this is the pineal region where there is a hyperdense lesion with a calcification in between and this is the occipital horns of lateral ventricles so in this image also we are able to see that there is a 
hyperdense lesion with calcifications in the periphery whereas in this there is in the center so the calcification in the center represents it is a germinoma whereas the calcifications which are in the periphery it means remember exploded it is a pineoblastoma or a pineocytoma Sorry. Although we do not have any uh, syndromic ap uh, applications to this one, I just wanted to make sure because these are important uh, for your upcoming exam. That's why I have discussed it here. So, coming to the next question. Rat tail appearance is seen in A. Ecclesia B. Feline esophagus C. Carcinoma esophagus D. Hiatus hernia Students, please be quick. Okay, before you answer, let me at least go through the anatomy here. So, this is a contrast study that is barium is given through the esophagus and we are able to see that there is filling in the esophagus but there is distal narrowing in the form of rat tail or a bird beak appearance just below the GE junction. There is dilated upper esophagus and this is because of loss of orbac or myentric plexus. Failure of organized esophageal peristalsis is causing impaired relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter. So, if this patient also has complaints for dysphagia of solids and liquids. More uh, clues to you. So, please give me the correct answer. And this is involving only less than 3.5 centimeters of the distal esophagus. And there is abrupt narrowing here after the esophageal dilatation. Yes, the answer is Ecclesia cardia. So, let us see about the other conditions as well. So, here we are able to see that there are continuous folds of 1 to 2 mm thick running horizontally around the entire circumference of the esophageal lumen. Right? So, this is looking like a feline esophagus. This is because of chronic GERT. In this image, we are able to see there are multiple irregular filling defects as well as there is complete narrowing. There are stitches. It is looking like apple core. Also, in clinical features, there will be only dysphagia to solids. Okay, that is characteristic. This is for CA esophagus. Coming to the next image, here we are able to see a retrocardiac density with the air fluid level. See, this is the gas fluid level and this is a hiatus hernia. These are the domes of diaphragm. Hiatus hernia are two types, sliding and rolling. Sliding is the most common and it is almost seen in 90% of the cases, whereas rolling is in seen in less than 10% of the cases. G junction is above or greater than 2 cm of esophageal hiatus. That means we are able to see the gastric folds at least three or more gastric poles will be seen. Whereas in rolling type, the GE junction is below. This is the diaphragm. This is the GE junction. But there will be a part of the stomach which is above the diaphragm. Whereas in this case, the GE junction is here 
and as well as the gastric fold is here the rest of the stomach duodenum everything continues here okay this is for a brief idea about hiatus hernia and how it looks on a chest x-ray coming to the next question 18 months old female with increasing incoordination and developmental regression t2 confluent increased signal intensity with periventricular white matter and centrum semi ovale with radiating linear decrease in signal intensity giving a tigroid pattern sparing of subcortical u fibers is also noted so the most likely diagnosis is the first thing you have to know is there are a few catchy words in radiology or in medicine which you are supposed to know the differential diagnosis and then eliminate the rest of them from the mcqs and mark the correct answer so the differential diagnosis for tigroid pattern is first metachromatic leukodystrophy and pantothenate kinase degen neurodegeneration which is also called as the other name is absolute now i don't want to confuse you okay metachromatic leukodystrophy and pkd the rest of the options alexander disease adrenal leukodystrophy and canavan's disease we will see in the images guys have answered it anyway oh okay so this is the image for metachroma metachromatic leukodystrophy this is the tigroid pattern this low signal intensity that we have been talking about and adrenal leukodystrophy involves the parieto occipital regions i'm only going to be telling you one point about each one of it so that you don't con get confused and mark the correct answer this is the one thing you have to remember adrenal leukodystrophy involves a parieto occipital white matter lesion as well as the corpus callosum that is the splenium of corpus callosum okay alexander's disease both of them are starting with a alexander is a emperor he is always at the start he is always at the front okay so only the bilateral frontal white matter is involved in this condition Canavan's disease is a spongiform degeneration which involves the white matter completely globally also it involves the subcortical u fibers this is one of the conditions which also involves the subcortical u fibers and the most important thing about canavan's disease is on mrs there is that is magnetic resonance spectroscopy there is increased na this is characteristic for canavan's disease the other uh, differential for uh, tigroid pattern this also has another sign of eye of the tiger this is because of the high intensity of the globus pallidus which is surrounded by the deposition which is giving low signal intensity so these are the eyes of the tiger which is characteristic for pantothenate kinase associated neurodegeneration okay so coming to the next question identify the lesion please answer quickly no okay let me um, start this so is there anyone else who wants to answer this question okay first first of all the approach to bone tumors you are supposed to look at the age of the patient if it is a pediatric age group or an adult age group if it is a pediatric age group the conditions are different if it is adult the conditions are different again so osteochondroma chondroblastoma osteoid osteoma and osteosarcoma so 
the next thing we have to look is whether if it is benign or malignant. So here we are, let us identify this is the benign condition. Chondroblastoma is a malignant condition. Osteochondroma is a malignant condition. Osteosarcoma is a malignant condition. So how do we say which is benign and which is malignant? For benign conditions, there will be sclerotic margins and they will be well defined. Whereas malignant, there will be ill defined margins. And there will be very little or no sclerosis at all. So at least from this, you can uh, tell me if it is a benign or a malignant one. Yes, it is a malignant lesion because it is ill-defined and there is periosteal reaction in the form of sundry appearance and there is elevation of the periosteum giving a triangular Codman's triangle is seen here. These two are characteristic for osteosarcoma. Good. So, depending upon the, we have discussed about the age. So, if it is less than 10 years, we should think about isnophilic granuloma, neuroblastoma, this is pretty much easy and if it is greater than 35 years age group and there are multiple lesions you should always think about metastasis from 10 1 to 10 years giving sarcoma is more common. It is more common in the tubular bones but we can also see them in the appendicular skeleton especially in the pubic region, pubic bones. So for 30 to 40 years the entire spectrum of fibrosarcoma, malignant fibrous histiocytoma, osteosarcoma, the types of osteo osteosarcoma also per periosteal, paraosteal, Telling there are actually seven types which are not very important for us. Mets are always a differential after 30 years. Multiple myeloma and chondrosarcoma. Okay. And also depending upon the location of the tumor, whether if it is in the central or if it is in the periphery, we can divide in central the mnemonic is like why I have drawn it uh, like this is because for the tubular bones fibrous dysplasia and the diaphysis region fibrous dysplasia diametaphysis region enchondroma and the epiphyseal region it is chondroblastoma but chondroblastoma can also occur in the periphery, periphery and uh, for the di diaphysis region simple bone cyst okay. and the eccentric lesions are GCT in epiphysis fibrous cortical defect non-ossifying fibroma aneurysmal bone cyst aneurysmal bone cyst the characteristic uh, thing about aneurysmal bone cyst is there are fluid fluid levels and chondromyxoid fibroma. Chondromyxoid fibroma is generally occurs at the upper part of tibia and there will be endosteal scalloping. What is endosteal scalloping? This is the cortex and this is the medulla. There will be this is endosteal scalloping. This is how the lesion will up appear and we will see in the images also. Uh, the most important part about a uh, simple bone cyst is there will be a phalan fragment sign.
actually this this part has fallen from there to here after the minimal trivial trauma there will be their patient will be presenting with a pathological fracture okay these are the important things about uh, bone tumors so this is a diagrammatic representation of all the bone tumors below 30 years and above 30 years so we are able to see that about 30 years we are talking more about more malignant conditions like mets myeloma and uh, enchondroma chondrosarcoma geode and infection are always a uh, differential in epiphysis even before or after 30 years infection should always be considered rather than directly going for malignancy osteochondroma we identify osteochondroma as a bony growth which is growing away from the joint this is the joint right so it is growing away from the bone and it always is with the cartilage in its cap it has extension from the medulla into the cortex these are the points you have to remember about bony exostosis or osteochondroma see here also the osteochondroma pedunculated exostosis which is seen growing away from the bone, uh, joint space and it is having extinction from the medulla fibrous dysplasia shows a ground glass appearance and the entire bone is involved that is the medulla as well as the cortex is involved osteomyelitis or any other aggressive lesion is always a differential but for osteomyelitis as we know there will be cloaca that is the opening and there is sequestrum that is a dead bone and aneurysmal bone cyst and unicameral simple bone cyst the uh, simple bone cyst will have fallen fragment sign Anismal bones cysts will show fluid fluid levels that was better seen on MRI. Osteoid osteoma is a benign condition where there will be a nidus and in the center because this nidus uh, is have produce produces prostaglandins when NSAIDs are given the, the pain reduces but it will increase in the night time. So osteoid osteoma is a benign condition but uh, if the pain is very much we need to go for radio frequency ablation although osteo osteoma can be in diaphysic region the most common pla place for osteo osteoma is the posterior elements of the spine that is the spinous process pedicle lamina osteoblastoma also is the next condition that is if it is greater than 3 centimeters we call it as osteoblastoma okay uh, we have already discussed osteosarcoma chondroblastoma occurs in the dia epiphyseal region and whenever we are seeing a chondro name that means the matrix is chondroid that is cartilage whenever we are seeing osteo it means the matrix is bone so that is how we differentiate uh, things this is another uh, important approach for uh, bone tumors so this this matrix is looking like bone whereas this matrix is looking like cartilage also the other important thing for cartilage is rings and arcs appearance of the ca cartilaginous matrix this is the paraosteal osteosarcoma we are able to see the periosteum and it is coming outside the bone that is why it is paraosteal the aggressive lesions sometimes we are not we will not be able to identify it there can be lytic or osteomyelitis stress fractures occur as a uh, one single cortical defect on one side especially in the weight bearing areas for pagets the important thing to know is there is trabeculations increased trabeculations and thinning of cortex there is blade blade of grass sign flame or blade of grass sign which is seen as a inverted v 
this is because of the lytic phase of the Paget's disease. Next coming to the broody sepsis, it is a chronic osteomyelitis that means there has been infection here but it has been localized to that area and there is sclerosis of the around the infection that is why broody sepsis is formed and it is most commonly seen in the upper end of tibia. Coming to the next question, 34 year old man with a history of ulcerative colitis presents with abdominal pain and copious diarrhea. His x-ray shows dilatation of the transverse colon. Which of the following is most consistent with the finding of toxic megacolon? We have already discussed points regarding toxic megacolon in the last class. I really hope you give me the correct answer this time. See, uh, there are other options also which are showing the possibility of toxic megacolon. But the most consistent finding is what the examiner is asking you. So, please be careful and read the question properly before answering. Yes, dilatation to 6 centimeters. Loss of frustration is also there, but there are other conditions also in which we will see loss of frustrations. Ulcerative colitis is associated with anemia. Uh, rectal lesion palpable on direct rectal examination is also will also be there because ulcerative colitis there will be definitely involvement of the rectum. And the other features, mucosal, submucosal inflammation, continuous inflammation, Previous sigmoid volvulus also can be a part of ulcerative colitis spectrum. But what the questioner is asked, the question here is, is about toxic megacolon in the most consistent finding. So the answer is dilatation to 6 centimeters. This is the abdomen x ray showing toxic megacolon. The transverse diameter of the colon, the transverse colon is definitely more than 6 centimeters. So it represents toxic megacolon. Coming to the next question, 22 week, okay, sorry, a 2 week old baby born at 29 weeks de develops abdominal distinction, raised inflammatory markers. The neonatal consultant suspects he may be having necrotizing enterocolitis. Which of the following is not associated with necrotizing colitis? C. 29 weeks born, 2 week old, whatever it is, it is preterm baby. That is the first thing you have to see. Okay. And we have already have we already have a diagnosis in this case. That is there is necrotizing colitis. What is not associated with necrotizing colitis? Please be quick. I want you to answer quickly please. Because time is up. Okay, let me eliminate some options for you. Uh, which of the following is not associated with necrotizing enterocolitis? A. Biliary atresia. B. Prematurity. Low birth weight. Congenital heart disease. So, it is already established that it is a premature baby. So, this is definitely not the answer. Most of the premature babies are low birth weight. This is also definitely not the answer. Congenital heart disease is more associated with infections. So, this is also not the answer. Biliary atresia and Hirschsprung's disease. So, biliary atresia. What happens in biliary atresia? Radiologically speaking, there will be a triangular cord sign. Just anterior to the portal vein because there is no biliary radicals. So, this is somewhere it is associated with the bowel. So, let us keep it as an option. Let's keep it open and let us see about Hirschsprung's disease first. 
I still did, didn't get an answer. Please be quick. Uh, Hispan's disease is about the distal colon and rectum. And it is a congenital anomaly. So, this does, is not associated with necrotizing enterocolitis. What is necrotizing enterocolitis in the first place? It is the bacteria in the wall of the bowel react and cause infection and cause necrosis. That means there is air within the bowel which will also spread outside. The classical radiographic signs for necrotizing enterocolitis is in initial periods it may be normal or there will be mild gastrointestinal dilatation that, that is dilatation of the bowel loops. Later there will be more intestinal dilatation and fixed dilated loops of bowel will be seen in the x-rays even in the after 6 hours or 24 hours. There will be pneumatosis intestinals that is there is air. In this, in this image we are able to see there is air within the bowel wall which is seen as dark areas here. This is the air pneumatosis intestinalis. Pneumatosis air within the intestinal wall. And there can be ascites and possible portal venous gas also. And then finally it will develop pneumoperitoneum. That is free air in the abdomen, which is two important, most important signs for pneumoperitoneum are regular sign, that is both the walls of the bowel are seen here. This is one, this is the bowel lumen. This wall is seen as well as the lumen is seen and from outside, from intraperitoneal, because of the presence of intraperitoneal free air, we are able to see both sides of the bowel. That is regular sign and football sign. Because of the intraperitoneal air, we will be able to see the falciform ligament. We will be able to see the falciform ligament. And the entire bowel will be seen in the center. And there will be a line around it and because there is also ascites and air, it will look like a football. Okay, so and let us see about the Hispring's disease also in detail so that we will never forget after we see the images. So here in this uh, neonatal abdominal x-ray, we are able to see there are multiple dilated bowel loops and there is very little or no rectal gas. In this contrast Im uh, image, we are able to see that there is dilation, dilatation of the distal colon and this is the transition point. For distal colon and rectum. The normal ratio for rectum to colon is greater than 1. That means rectum is larger than the colon. But in this case we are able to see clearly that the colon is larger. Colon in the sense distal colon that is sigmoid in particular not the entire colon. So uh, in this case we are able to see that the rectum is smaller than the sigmoid colon. This is because of the aganglionosis of the distal colon. This is classical for Hispring's disease. And this is no way associated with ne necrotizing enterocolitis. So, our answer is Hispring's disease. Okay. Coming to the next question. 55 year old man with abdominal pain and idiopathic, idiopathic pancreatitis, what is the most likely diagnosis? 
A. Annular pancreas B. Chronic pancreatitis C. Pancreatic divism D. Pancreatic pseudocyst So, to make it easy for you, let me label this. This is an MRCP image. This is duodenum. This is the gallbladder. This is the right hepatic duct, left hepatic duct, form, forming the common hepatic duct. And somewhere, maybe this is the cystic duct. And this is the CBD from here common bile duct it is the common bile duct entering into the D2 part of the duodenum so this is entirely duodenum we are able to see there is a line here and another fluid filled structure here this is supposed to be the place for pancreas because this is a heavily titubated image. We are only able to see and there is suppression of the other structures also. We are able to see only the fluid filled, uh, fluid filled structures in this. So MRCP. is the investigation of choice for pancreatic anomalies. ERCP can also be done but it is invasive and uh, there are chances of more pancreatitis uh, occurring in the future for the patient. I still didn't get an answer from you. There is a lag. Okay, first, uh, before go going to the answer, let me tell you briefly about the pancreatic embryology. This is the duodenum, this is the ventral butt, sorry, this is the dorsal butt, this is the ventral butt. From ventral butt, liver, gallbladder, and uncinate process head of pancreas are formed whereas from the dorsal blood the rest of the pancreas is formed so what happens is after seventh week there will be rotation so the ventral blood comes to this side and after eighth week there will be fusion of the dorsal and ventral buds. Okay. This is the main pancreatic duct and this is the minor pancreatic duct. If there is abnormality in the rotation or if there is abnormality in the fusion, we will have pancreatic anomalies. If there is abnormality in the rotation, So, from the ventral, <clears throat> from the dorsal bud, the main pancreatic duct will fuse with the minor pancreatic duct and opens into the major duodenal papilla. Whereas the this part of dorsal uh, bud of the pancreas will open into the minor duodenal papilla. Okay. So if there is any abnormality in the fusion,
there will be pancreatic division that means the dorsal bud will open differently and the ventral bud will open differently whereas if there is any abnormality in the rotation there will be annular pancreas so out on the duodenum we will be able to see the pancreas is engulfed outside completely on all the sides generally it is supposed to be on the medial aspect right this is where the pancreas generally is for the d2 so, whereas in case of annular pancreas the d2 is completely encircled or engulfed by the pancreas and it will cause recurrent episodes of pancreatitis as well as there will be duodenal stenosis so we need to operate these cases so coming to the question so this is a better diagram for the pancreatic division that is abnormality of the fusion at, if the fusion does not happen at 8 weeks the main pancreatic duct will open into the minor papilla minor duodenal papilla and the ventral duct will open into the major duodenal papilla along with the cbd as we have already discussed the ventral bud is forming the liver gallbladder uncinate process and head of pancreas from liver what comes from the gallbladder what comes as the chd comes from liver and cystic duct comes from liver and it will form the cbd so here the cbd and the major uh, uh, ventral duct are opening into the major duodenal papilla which is an anomaly normally what happens is if the fusion happens the major part of the uh, major duodenal papilla drainage is from the main pancreatic duct and a small portion is only from the ventral duct this is the major duodenal papilla which opens into the d2 part of the duodenum and sphincter of ode will be there managing the flow of the bile uh, flow of the juice into the duodenum so as i have given you the clue already there are two lines here draining into the duodenum this is a case of pancreatic division pancreatic division also they'll have uh, recurrent episodes of pancreatitis and abdominal pain coming to the last but one question kidneys which single statement regarding the kidneys is true the right kidney lies slightly lower than the left kidney hyla lie at the t12 vertebral level the subcostal nerves lie anterior to the kidneys the right kidney lies posterior to the jejunum this is a pretty easy one please answer quickly okay so just so you don't never forget um, from t12 the celiac axis comes and l1 sma comes from l2 the renal arteries and from l3 level the inferior mesenteric artery comes so the hilum will lie definitely at the l1 l2 level and not at the t12 vertebral level the subcostal nerves lie posterior to the kidney the right kidney lies posterior to the jejunum no the left kidney lies posterior to the jejunum and right kidney generally lies slightly lower than the left kidney because of the presence of liver liver is there that is why right kidney is generally slightly lower than the left kidney 
okay the anterior and the posterior relations of left kidney and right kidney first let us go through the right kidney uh, obviously anteriorly there will be adrenal gland on both sides but for the right side there is liver duodenum and right colic flexure on the left side there is spleen stomach pancreas and left colon colic flexure in jejunum the posterior relations are mostly same for both of them diaphragm 12th rib psoas major quadratus lumborum transverse abdominis subcostal nerve ilio hypogastric nerve and ilio inguinal nerve so as we have seen uh, the in our question also the posterior relation the subcostal nerve ilio hypogastric nerve and ilio inguinal nerve these are posterior obviously the psoas and quadratus lumborum and transverse abdominis muscles are a part of the posterior abdominal wall so they will be posterior only and the 11th and 12th ribs and diaphragm protect the kidney from external trauma also these are all the posterior relationship of the kidneys okay coming to the next question next and last question a 42 year old man with known tuberculosis presents with blood in the urine and right loin pain ct urogram presents with blood in uh, perform performed out of hours showed calcial horns and signet ring appearance on excretory phase study most likely cause and most likely diagnosis the cause is tuberculosis what is the most likely diagnosis Okay, renal papillary necrosis is characteristic for TB and there are multiple signs. This is the infundibulum and this is the papilla, the infundibulum, this entire thing is the calyx. So this is the normal appearance of the papilla in cases of renal papillary necrosis because of the small micro infarcts that are caused due to uh, infection we get renal papillary necrosis but renal papillary necrosis also occurs in other conditions uh, such as pyelonephritis obstruction sickle cell disease any area where there there is a chance of infarct in the kidneys it uh, there is a chance of getting renal papillary necrosis Okay, pyelonephritis, obstruction, sickle cell disease, tuberculosis, cirrhosis, analgesic abuse that is NSAIDs, renal vein thrombosis, diabetes mellitus, systemic vasculitis. The classical features in TB are golf, golf ball on T, this is the ball and this is the T. There is a golf ball on T appearance of due to papillary necrosis. After a certain point of time, or in some cases, we will be able to see the pap uh, the infundibulum is grown into the papilla, and it will cause this is the golf ball, and this is the lobster claw. And this is the signet ring appearance. These three are very classical for tuberculosis and the slopped papillae uh, can be seen in the calyx as well as, as you are able to see in this image. So with this I would like to end my session. Thank you for being such a interactive audience and uh, hope to see you soon and please make sure you check the medicoscommunity.com and uh, grab the early bird offer as soon as possible. Thank you.